A major security alert was launched after the car drove up to the entrance to Downing Street and burst into flames. It was only after firemen had put out the blaze that police realized they were dealing with a horrific suicide. It's now known the dead man was an unemployed road sweeper. Relatives say he'd been deeply distressed about not finding work. Joel, Joel, and listen, lads. You'll hear the cool fierce working. There's many a mother missing, lads, because he wouldn't listen, lads. My father always used to say, it works more than you and You've got to coax the coal away, not gone rivin' and chewin'. So jowl, jowl, and listen, lads, you'll hear the coal face workin'. There's many a murder missin', lads, because he wouldn't listen, lads. What's your attitude to work? Mine's been one of avoidance, largely. And what does it mean when somebody burns himself to death for lack of it? If you have got a job, how secure do you feel in it? And when was the last time anybody was able to look you in the eye and say, there'll be a return to full employment without sounding like a snake oil salesman? When I left school in 1960, I was given a card and told to be a welder in Swan Hunter's shipyard on Tyneside. I declined, but many of my generation took the card, along with the promise of a job for life and the security that went with it. This is not a programme about the death of the working class. It's about the need to redefine work and the death of work as we've known it. When we began to make this film, Swan Hunters, builders of high-tech ships, was taken into the hands of the official receiver. A campaign has been built across the community to save this yard from the government's willful neglect. 600 years of shipbuilding here. As the campaign gathered momentum, it seemed the right place to start with a film about work in a region that many claim to be the cradle of the Industrial Revolution and will fight back. OK, here we are outside the City Hall on the 6th of July for the Swan Hunters gig. Just going to see how it's going and if you sold any tickets, you know, if I can sneak in the back door. Is there any chance of getting in for a fight? No, you're bored. <laughs> so, Ray, what's happening? How's it going? Well, as you can see, it's a hive of activity. Good. Mm. It's going to be a good night, eh? Well, the afternoon's been great. If the, the, show's, <laughs> if the show's not as good as the afternoon, we're laughing. All right. So, um, are you going to let us lie in or what? Well, come on, then you better. Follow me. All right. For those people looking in on television, Swan Hunters has been a part of the Northeast for so many years, along with shipbuilding. And it's not just because it's traditional that we want Swan Hunters to continue. We want it to continue, obviously, for jobs and the families of those people working there. But we want it to succeed because they're the best. Do you think work has uh, any other function than to provide an income? I think work is more than just selling labor. To earn money. I, I think work is how a person expresses themselves in life. It is, in a sense, part of their fulfillment. It is part of a worthwhile life. This is why I believe that most people want to work. This is why some people take jobs which pay less money when they could just as easily take jobs that pay more because they're driven by a vocational drive, by a, a sense that they want to fulfill themselves, to use their talents and abilities. So the answer is that I don't think work is simply a commercial transaction. It's a part of life. That's why I think most people want to work, even in circumstances where it barely pays them to work, because there is psychic income from work. Psychic income? That's an interesting notion. I wonder if shareholders could be persuaded to take a psychic dividend as a return on their investments. But enough of voodoo economics. When British Aerospace recently made hundreds of men redundant, the then minister, Michael Jack, described them as liberated. 2,000 blokes have already been liberated from Swan Hunters. I went to see one of them, Mickey Russell, to see if he felt liberated. I've only been out three weeks and I've done well over 40 applications for different jobs. And rather than just straight away, I went round all the factories and 
gave them them by hand, asking if they've got any vacancies. There's at least four turned around and said, well, we don't, we don't uh, employ people over 40. And to say that a man over 40 is finished, it's, it's disgusting. Uh, you know, I, I don't know where you go. You've got 25 years of your working life yet left, and people are writing you off. Retirement at 40, and no sense of liberation then. In the mid-80s, I was a writer in residence at Austin and Pickersgill shipyard in Sunderland, picking port. Last time I wrote a book I and was, made two uh, films about the river's the demise. You had a After five years in the cobbles, I wondered if those blokes were now enjoying that. their liberation. In 1989 or 1988 and 1989, it was running up the, basically the closure and the, 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 the blowing off of the map of the shipbuilding industry in this, in this town. We'd done everything we had to do. Uh, with regards to diversifying away. As Fred's just indicated, that we know people who'd went and done uh, courses, that educated themselves and trained themselves to better themselves with regards to qualifications and experience in other areas. And then at the end of the day, and now it's like sort of June 1993, we're talking about coming up to five years and we're no further forward. We all have a love affair with Sunderland, we love Sunderland. We're not here as some underground uh, schism that's trying to smash up Tory policy. If they don't give us something to put our teeth into, then we'll follow it. What we are seeing is uh, a total attack on the, on the whole livelihood of the town. If you look back in our history, you've gone back even into when men lived in caves. They were not just surviving then, they were creating, they were working, they were doing paintings around the cave, they were going on improving the environment, not just surviving by going out and getting enough to eat, killing stuff to eat, but they were actually trying to improve the environment. If you think about it, you know, it's in man, it's in man's instinct anyway, to be doing something, to do something worthwhile and trying to achieve something. And that comes back right through history. When, when that doesn't happen, you then, become decadent and you look again at history and you see the, the, the overthrow and the failure of empires where they become that decadent and just collapses and that could be happening now in ours. Just like in the Mikado, I've got a little list <laughs> of benefit offenders who I'll soon be rooting out and who never would be missed, they never would be missed. There's those who make up bogus claims in half a dozen names and councillors who draw the dole to run left-wing campaigns. <laughs> they never would be missed. They never would be missed. There's young ladies who get pregnant just to jump the housing queue and dads who won't support the kids of the ladies they have kissed. <laughs> and I haven't even mentioned all those sponging socialists. I've got them on my list, and there's none of them be missed. There's none of them be missed. This is a poem written in response to somebody coming up for the first time in their life against the uh, DSSS and their stonewalling techniques. Um, so, and it's called Depravity and Deprivation, the Double D Economy. Back of the pub, a Rockweiler ripped a kid's throat out. Nanny broke baby skulls. 5 a.m. phone calls. Hello? There is no response. The internal phone in the DSSS isn't working. They only listen when you think they aren't. If there was a riot, I would have joined it. If I had a machine gun, I would have shot it. Fuck Kung Fu all at once. Can't come against it hard on. You'll just leak all over the shatterproof glass. Got to pour your outrage in a bottle. Light the fuse and throw it at the right moment in congenial company. Or join the grillers for a pair of boots. Meanwhile, who's for dinner? Eat leather, lick hockle off the trough. Come, joins us. Not only is shipbuilding being shut down on the East Coast, but the mining industry has just been collapsed. 
I went to see some women in Siem Harbour who had organised a vigil to show their solidarity while the fight was going on to keep their pits open. But why, I wondered, would anybody want to fight for filthy, dirty jobs for men anyway? Hello, Hello there. Tom Pickard. Is this where I get my fortune to? This is it, exactly. <laughs> yes, we tell you fortunes for you. Thank you. Just close the door. You say it hasn't only affected the mines, has it? There's lots more. I mean, women's jobs in particular. There's office workers, canteen workers, even the wives themselves, you know. You don't love the work down the mines. That's there are very right. few people who actually love the work down the mines. But the things that come from that, which are about security and about knowing who you are and about knowing what your future's about, then that creates a certain... Um, feeling of belonging, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. which which is hard to let go of, and the mines symbolise that. Mm -hmm. And if they do close the mine down, the mines down completely, then they don't replace them with anything, and that was clear from closing down Dorden, which is getting um, sewerage works on the site. They're not replacing it with anything that's, um, that's going to give people an alternative future. Working on the railroad, for a dollar Working on the railroad, for a dollar day. Working on the real good buddy for a dollar day. Gotta get my money, gotta get my pay. Take this hammer, take it to the captain. Take this hammer, take it to the captain. Take this hammer, good buddy, and take it to the captain. to work are ambiguous and I wanted to find out about ancient attitudes to work so I spoke to the archaeologist Rosemary Cram. Well, what, at which point did, I mean what interests me is that, that, that these are utilitarian tools but at which point did, did art, did it become art? I mean when did somebody stop making something because it was a tool or did they shape a tool in a particular way because they got some aesthetic pleasure? As far back as you can ever get in society, some people decorate things. Some people take a pride in their craftsmanship, which, you know, makes it stand out. And they try to mark it in some way. There are two sorts of ways at which artifacts are, if you like, enhanced. One is to enhance, as you would naturally think, the individual um, and to put their mark on it or a tribal mark. The other is if, you, if they are presented to the gods. And so they have, uh, they have a value that is beyond their human value, and you decorate them very, very specially. And so this conception that what you are making isn't only just for now, but somehow you join yourself with eternity by making things, um, is where another way in which art lifts off, of course, and artifacts mm. lift off. From here to eternity. From about the 1880s, the regular capitalist labour market embraced the majority of the working population and the term unemployment was invented. At the same time, unemployment was identified as a social problem. That problem was addressed with the creation of the welfare state in the 1940s. William Beveridge was one of its architects. William Beveridge had a really clear idea of what the world ought to look like. He saw men working full-time 
uh, for 40 or 50 years between the end of education and the beginning of retirement. Unemployment was very clearly something different. There was a very fixed boundary between being in work and being out of work. And women, once they were married, worked at home, being supported by the male breadwinner's family wage. Now, he also made it very clear when he designed the unemployment system and the unemployment centers that he was completely opposed to casual labor. Because even in the early part of this century, you still had that old craft tradition of working people, sometimes working six months of the year, and earning quite enough to see them through the whole year, and not seeing any reason at all why they should work for 12 months of the year if they could get enough money in six months of the year. Beveridge was completely against that, and he made it very clear that in order to qualify for unemployment insurance benefit, you would have to be available for work. And so his system of benefits was partly designed to create the system of, of work discipline, which he saw necessary for uh, early 20th century industrial capitalism. I then went to see the man who had written extensively and controversially on the end of the working class. Monsieur Gauze, I presume. <laughs> How are you? May I come in and talk to you? Come on. Thank you. <clears throat> there has never been full employment in capitalism. And we are now moving through an, a technological revolution, which is as fundamental as the first industrial revolution 200 years ago. Uh, jobs, or rather work, labor, is being eliminated at a fantastic pace. Growth no longer makes for new jobs. We have the growth, the, the jobless growth. The more capital industry or services are allowed to invest, the more jobs they automate away. There is no return to full employment, if by full employment you mean that everyone works full-time, all year round, during his whole active life. This is finished. And I must say, it could be a liberation. There's that word again. Hello, fellow travellers. It's good to have you. You're all very beautiful. But you can call me Johnny Boy, how tight And move on right on down But I'll never get my job back now Not now them buses have gone opo That is one person operation Gives a good conducting boy no hope -o. And if it isn't just the ticket making people unemployed, then no conductor buses, it is something to avoid. Who's gonna help you to get off and on? Who's gonna hand out the conversation? Who's gonna stand in the cubby hole? Who is gonna say? How tight are you all right? How tight? Hold on, hold on very tightly.
The man's thought to have doused himself with petrol before setting the car alight. Petrol cans were later found in the wreckage. If unemployment, to quote Norman Lamont, was a price well worth paying, should the country feel grateful to the unemployed? To get inflation down, there's a whole number of measures that have to be taken, uh, which inflict pain on a whole range of people in the community. And it's pretty tough. It's a, it's a very tough, tough world out there. That's why we need to improve our competitiveness. The, the company that is uh, renting out uh, temporary workers, it's they who say, employers come to us as if they were cattle traders. They ask us to sell them, to rent out to them the number of people with the, uh, they, they need, for the time they need, with the qualifications they need, and then fire them at any moment. And this, uh, I mean, it's totally, inhuman. it's the breakdown of a civilization and of a society that was based on the work ethic, on the loyalty to, to the to the firm or to, to, to the to work you were doing to, that was uh, based on identification with your skill, with your profession, all this is collapsing. We are living in a much more uh, contractual society, in a sense a subcontracting society and a subcontracting economy. Uh, in the old days, a, a, a firm would have tried to have as many of the services that make up its product um, performed in-house by its own, its own teams dedicated to the purpose. Uh, the modern trend is, in fact, to contract out all of this to specialist firms. Uh, it, it, it allows you to hire the expertise without having to ma maintain an in-house establishment. And if you're using contractors, you can, of course, change contractors. And therefore, you get competition between contractors, and you get much more rapid introduction of innovation. Uh, it benefits the whole economy. I was 52 when the shipyards closed. Uh, uh, not having the responsibility of a young family, I was prepared to take any work, which I still am, uh, anywhere. So uh, what materialised out of this is, is uh, uh, over a, a long period, I've done 12 short-term contracts. The longest ranging from four to, to four months, the longest was four months, and the shortest was five days. The whole uh, caboose of that was one year and two months work in the five years since the close of the shipyard. Uh, you do feel what's happened makes you little more than an industrial gypsy. You get, you get firms in Europe who, are, who are got their workers on holiday, sent to, sent to England, sent to Britain, we'll get somebody there, they'll work for probably less money and everything. And, and that is the sort of humiliating experiences that that all of us have had to put up with. What's happening is, is that employers are saying, um, we want you on a contractual basis. We don't want to be responsible for your pension, for your national insurance contributions. We don't want to pay for you for your sickness, for your holidays. What you do is you sell us your labour, we'll pay you a price for it, the lowest we can, and if we don't need you, there's no work and there's no job. That's casualised employment. Isn't that, isn't that what the government calls self-employment? I mean, aren't we all supposed to be businessmen? Is, is this basically the reality of that philosophy? Well, this is one of the great myths of the 1980s, the, of, the, the, the growth of self-employment. If you look at the numbers, what you see is that people have been moving um, not from employment to unemployment, but from self-employment to unemployment, and when, and when the unemployment numbers go down, from unemployment to self-employment. And um, that isn't actually um, professional people starting companies. That's actually working people um, being obliged by the conditions in which they find themselves to call themselves employed. It could be a cleaner, it could be somebody working on a, on a construction site having to call themselves self-employed because their employer isn't paying their pension contribution, isn't paying them health or sickness benefit or any of those things. They now have to look after that themselves. They are employed on a self-employed basis. It is, the, it is the mirror image of a casualised workforce. A casualised workforce is self-employed. Self-employment or self-exploitation? I always thought a largely self-employed society was an economically underdeveloped one. Anyway, if we're all self-employed these days, do we need trade unions? I remember being told in the 80s by a worthy dame that they'd outlived their usefulness. Trade unions in Britain are still thought of as basically representing 
the workforce in some kind of confrontation with the employers. Uh, their whole history is redolent with, with mass working class solidarity. That's not what trade unions are going to be about in the future. They're going to be about providing services for their members, for their members who will in some cases work for different employers in succession, in some cases for different employers simultaneously. Trade unions will provide their members with legal teams, experts in drawing up contracts, in monitoring contracts, in, in, in uh, policing the conditions by which they work for different employers. In other words, trade unions formed to operate as mass working class movements are largely irrelevant in that context. And the, the relationship between capital and labor uh, has indeed changed, if, if indeed uh, labour is employed on a contractual basis. Contract man. Be a casual, take a chance. What have you got to lose? An eye or an arm or a severed spine? And brother, your right to choose. So shut your trap and dip and fight back when the rigging is insecure. Fall off a plank and draw a blank. And brother, you'll work no more. Don't give no shit to the management prick when you're in those double bottoms, but learn to lick his contract stick, your union rights forgotten. So shut your trap and divin fight back when the rigging is insecure. Fall off a plank and draw a blank and brother you'll work no more. Don't take the hump in the engine sump when you weld that deep thin seam or start to cough, the extractor's off. Did you hear your mara scream? So shut your trap and divin and fight back when the rigging is insecure. Fall off a plank and draw a blank and brother, you'll work no more. Your lungs are full and your senses dull but try to think of when you had some pride, stood side by side with other union men. So shut your trap and divin and fight back when the rigging is insecure. Fall off a plank and draw a blank and brother, you'll work no more. Come on me boys, put... Come on, me boys, put down your toys and bring the union out to protect your pay and the family. Hey, you'd better friggin' shoot. Don't shut your trap. You must fight back when the rigging is insecure or you'll draw a blank when that missing plank means you'll work no more. I wrote that poem several years ago. I was commissioned to write it by shop stewards in Sunderland who are old enough to remember the true cost of casual labour. They also had a nous to want to communicate it down the line, especially to young people. Changes in the workplace, driven by the ideology and enabled by the technology, means that the rigging is getting more insecure for all of us these days. Projections in the States are that uh, within the next few years, people in permanent employment, in so-called standard employment, will be a minority, and the majority of the population will be doing casual work. In the UK these last three months, 70,000 job losses have occurred in the banking, insurance and finance industries. Another 35,000 are at immediate risk. In the northeast, banking accounted for the largest uptake of school leavers in the private sector. These were the jobs meant to replace those lost in mining, shipbuilding and engineering. Now there is almost no recruitment of school leavers. On Tyneside, TSB have set up an experimental branch, a peopleless bank. Over the last five years in particular, We've seen the development of things like PC-based technology, graphics technology, and it's beginning to be a tool that's used in a whole, air, a whole raft of um, what one might call intellectual and creative tasks. Now, all the signs are that that is going to continue, um, and its power as a tool in management, administration, advanced administration, creative areas, research areas uh, and other forms of, of intellectual working, knowledge-based working, will continue. Um, now, that does mean that you can do a lot more. It does mean that an individual can do a lot more, but it can also mean that you don't have to employ so many individuals to do the same amount of work. We can see the coming of an entirely different way of living that will be as different in, in 
nature and quality um, and scope as our life is different from the early years of the Industrial Revolution, let alone pre the Industrial Revolution. And it's all happening very, very quickly. The enabling capability of the technology is expanding far faster than the institutions within society for managing change can cope with, up to and including the government. They used to erect technology, they knew what it was for. Jobs go out the window when machines come through the door. Losing your employment can leave you on the shelf or you can get a job as Robin Hood are working for yourself. This is a new factory in County Durham where they make microchips. Wonder if I get a job here? I am a roving rambler, a bit of Timmy Trid. I can fix you anything, a camshaft to a spade. I can fix a dodgy gearbox, man, a broken tread. You coke a lail and engine while I'm standing on me head. It's a shift, boy, shift, do the job and draw your pay. When the job is finished, I'll be moving on me way. I'll clean me tools and wrap them in a pair of oily jeans. You'll always find me working where you find the big machines. Rubbers, that's just stream growing in. So why why is all this necessary? Well, the most sort of the biggest contaminant we have in the area is the people. Oh, so we try to that's... limit the amount of contamination that comes mm -hmm. off. That's the trouble with people, really, isn't it? Us. And that's us, is it? That's us. You don't get a hat or anything. Nope, that's enough. We're trying to make sure that the people that we take on board are people that are going to be open to different thinking, uh, are people who are going to respond well to training, people whose flexibility is assured. In other words, ours is an industry that is subject to constant change and we want people that are prepared to move from one work area to another, as required, to accept that work will come through not in a nice, nice smooth, even flow. It follows that um, typically people will be younger, typically. We do not have um, barriers as far as age is concerned, but we find that the average age of the employee here is about 28, 29. So it's a relatively young workforce, where again there's a more open attitude towards learning new things. Obviously we know that people create um, contamination of the product. So the extent to which we can automate uh, is fundamental to the future of our business. Not many married women join the company who have families because they do find it tiring and very difficult to combine both their family life with the shift life. Myself, I don't have that problem because I don't have the ties. I suppose the semiconductor industry has got to be the industry of the future, hasn't it? I mean, that's where everything's going. Uh, and you've seen gradually more and more factories opening up like this in England and Scotland and what have you. Do you feel secure in this kind of work? Pits and things that are going to close, I mean, a lot of them have. It's industries like this that are up and coming they're going to take over, be one of the big industries in the area. What is work, anyway? Is it only something you do in a factory, office, school? Is writing a poem or changing a nappy work? And are we educated for a world of work in this country that's no longer there? Everywhere, education is, is behind uh, the, the, the situation, the, the actual situation. And the real scope goal of education nowadays would no longer be to fill the minds of people with data. Data, they are in computers, they are in, in data banks. You know, to have to have a, a, a terrible trained memory with lots of, of punctual uh, knowledge. In it. What people nowadays have to be trained for is to do what computers cannot do. That is imagination, capacity to move from one problem to another, to see transversal connections which a computer can't see. To, to have uh, manual and intellectual skills 
that are beyond a computer's reach, to have sensitivity, emotion, common sense, all that a computer can't have. This is what education is all about. Work is the only expression the working man is allowed. All of every man's fuel is needed for the fire. I am the stoker. I snatch children into my arms and teach them the meaning of fear. I galvanize pain, manufacture respect, create duty and weld it to drudgery. Industry is love. Industry is life. Work is the only word in the language I trust. All others are convoluted with meaning to confuse the ignorant man. Here's Fred, look. Remember him? The whole scene changed completely, and people realised, people like ex-shipyard -ship workers who live in the real world realised that they were in for a consolidated spell on the door. And uh, if you don't take cognizance of that situation, uh, then you could vegetate and go to seed. So you've got to look for other diversities. I've always liked to read and uh, uh, by chance, my son recently brought us uh, the works, the full works of uh, Oscar Wilde as a present. And uh, it wasn't the sort of thing I was used to reading, but uh, I thought with him buying it as a present, I would attempt to read it. But anyway, after a while, uh, I become fascinated with uh, the depths of his thought and uh, um, how he could put words together. The, connotations of the things he said and the underlying uh, trickery, you might say, or innovation under, underneath what he had to say. And, uh, uh, I started to read other authors and, and try to formulate a, a way of writing yourself. I've decided uh, that in September that I'm, I'm going to go to the local um, college and see if, I, if there is any anything else but sawdust in the cranium, I'll try to see if I can improve on it. So what, what, do you, what do you think you'll get from that? A little more than self-gratification at my age, but uh, I think everybody's got ego and that ego's got to be stimulated, so even if it's only self-gratification, at least you're doing something with your life and, you're, and possibly in various circumstances it might become of some benefit, hopefully. Mickey Russell thought he could be of some benefit, and during an earlier spell of unemployment, took a course in caring for the mentally handicapped when the call went out to retrain and develop new skills. You're getting job satisfaction out of working with people with Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, Down syndrome pe uh, people. It's fantastic. Both my children, well, my daughter's a dear saint officer, and my, my son's a missionary, and, the satisfaction they get out of the job has got to be seen to be believed. I mean, I've spent my life bashing bits of metal, and I'm grateful I've had, a, I've had a living out of it. I wouldn't say I've had a good living out of it, but I've had a living out of it. And uh, but job satisfaction, I've never felt job satisfaction like I did in while I was doing those courses and I was on placement with the mentally handicapped. It was superb. There must be a demand for care of jobs. So why isn't it got one? The way they're doing it, they're taking short-term, um, short-time workers on part-time, uh, and obviously for, for a married man to go off for work and they say, well, we can give you 16 hours a week, at two pounds 50 an hour, it, you know, getting a stamp paid, it, you just can't live on that kind of money. What gets me is they keep saying there's, um, there's uh, all plenty of voluntary work, there's a lot of avenues in that mind, you know, plenty <coughs> of voluntary work. It's on the television all the time, will you come and help you help? Those jobs must be needed, so why not set people on and pay them a wage, a living wage? But it seems though they're wanting everybody to do it voluntary. And then if you go and do something voluntary and you're on the dole or, or you're on the sick, you know, anything like that, you're getting pensions anyway, they're sent for you straight away, you're working, you know, you know and you're doing it voluntary. And it's it's all to be questioned, it's really. Been can't. Really it is. Haven't they? Very, very it's really got everybody down. Economies run through cycles. When they're rich, they do public works projects. Uh, when they're poor, when they're running fifty billion pound deficits, they don't tend to increase spending. And you're living in cloud cuckoo land if you believe that just coming out of a long and deep recession, a government is going to suddenly spend billions of pounds on necessary projects. Uh, simply to mop up unemployment. 
cloud cuckoo land. I used to work in a city of London once, delivering delicacies, rare cheeses to the directors of the Bank of England and other city institutions. When these gentlemen eat their prunes and shit, the pound will float and we will swim in it. We could mop that up. Why can't we collectively loot, for instance, to make a moral point? Instead of people individually going thieving from shops, I mean, there have been movements in South America and Italy, and it was happening in the 70s, when people said, OK, um, I'm not, I refuse to be individually criminalised. Collectively, we'll go together and we'll take everything we need. Have you, have you ever <laughs> contemplated anything like that? Well, I mean, I've, I've got to say that it isn't actually TUC policy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is an individualist future, as preached from the temples of the city, set in stone? Much more like a or is there anything to rescue from our past, and I would from the trade union just movement, got the of the and, and two of the I spoke to the Bishop of Durham um, in the Durham so many of Institute. Them actually have quotations which they've turned almost from the Bible into fraternity. Mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the whole ethic of the thing comes out uh, as um, solidarity together, caring for one another and all the rest of it. And the banners, of course, I take it, um, actually got their ideas from church banners anyway. Um, you see, I mean, medieval times when the guilds carried their oh, yeah. things and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, you see, there you are, for the people, by the people. This is what the wealth is really about. There's always a sort of moral message about it, mm. and some people may think it comes from Marx, but more of these banners actually came from the Bible and the chapel. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, one of the ones we just looked at, I mean, the actual the stress was on the, um, the safety. Yes. On a little hospital that they built, so it was always about building a community and that's resources. Right. And, and, and caring for one another. Mm -hmm. and that's the one I like. Yes, that's Knowledge is power. Yes, the future is in your hands, you see. Well. Uh, and the whole business of democracy. Uh, that was the great ideal, and then somehow um, things partly degenerated and were partly misinterpreted, so that, as you know, not so long ago, um, the notion was able to be sold that the trade unions were really the enemy of society, wasn't it? Yeah. And I mean, that shows... Um, but that is all part of a breakdown of no sense of the different groups in society having common contribution to make to a common society. And I suppose we are now at a wholly individualistic market approach to things where the notion of working together is only one for working for profit. And that's really making a hell of a mess. Mm. <laughs> Just down the road, the Durham miners and their allies gather for the annual game, here to celebrate solidarity, to hear speeches and find out who has died and who's been born. I call it to reaffirm my faith, to rediscover that I'm not alive, to be part of a union, if you like. Imagine banners designed by some new material. We could dance in the night. This is not the death of a working class. Families celebrate, and those without fair families for a dinner. It's a hell of a piss of a woman. Why is this woman crying? Is it for something lost, like a dream? If it is, it's one more than a dinner. Just one sound. But it's time for the crying to stop. Unity is strength. What do you say, Paul? And why accept an imposed agenda that says when the pits or shipyards close, so does the culture be built and sustained? I think they should expand this into an international festival, cultural and political. I'm closing down the something for nothing society. Bollocks. There's no such thing as a something for nothing society. The free market drives down wages and conditions. Government policy disarms the union, creates unemployment, and follows through with benefit cuts. That benefit system massively indebts claimants or fuels the black economy, 
drives many into petty crime and an increasing number into suicide. I asked the Bishop of Durham if he thought hungry people had the right to steal food. Clearly he wouldn't, but he recognised the dilemma. Yes, I think that's the point we are, we are getting to, and I think it shows the sickness of our society generally that this is not widely recognised, and there is this constant pressure, I'm sorry to say, by ministers as much as anyone else to criminalise the poor, to say, first of all, it's always their fault, secondly, they're handling it badly, and thirdly, they are performing criminal actions, so we must tighten things up. Uh, now, um, as a bishop, I know that everybody sins, and no doubt poor people uh, sin in a poor way, just as rich people sin in a rich way, uh, and so there'll always be people who will buck the system or make a worse mess of it than they need, but overall, it is clear that um, people are simply not provided with the means of subsistence. So this criminalization of the poor and the forcing them into things is perhaps one of the greatest criticisms of our society, but it isn't just of our society, the individuals or even the politics. It's really of this economics we've been talking about that we've got trapped in. Here are people not only being wasted, but turned into anti-people. And that is the very contradiction of what any society should be about. Adam Smith thought that economics was only a part of life. He thought that the most uh, salient characteristic about human beings is that we have a natural sympathy, almost an empathy, for each other. And he thought moral principles were indeed founded from that fact. But I think he'd recognize that in the market, we're able to engage in transactions to mutual advantage with people we'll never meet in distant countries. And he would be very pleased that the way the world seems to be moving towards extending that propensity across the globe. Have you noticed everybody's called a customer now? Got on a train the other day, they said, customers who boarded the train at Derby. And I said to the ticket collector, I'm not a customer, I'm a passenger. And he said, no, you're a customer. If I go to have a kidney operation in hospital, am I a customer or a patient? If you hold up before the magistrate, does he say customer at the bar? You're charged with, does the Bishop of Durham talk about dearly beloved customers? Does the Queen talk about our customers here and abroad on Christmas Day? I'll tell you something about a customer you may have missed. You can't be a customer if you haven't got any money. And that's what the whole thing is about. The beggars in the streets of London, the homeless in the streets of London, don't have money, so they're non-customers and they don't exist. And unless, as a movement, we reassert that we are people, we're human beings, we're men and women and children and old people, and we are entitled as a right to a decent life. Yeah, but how are we going to get it? And why aren't the unemployed organised? Four million makes a hell of a lot. I think the bridge should be built between unemployment people and the people that's working, mm -hmm. and the unions should be able to do that. We have got to say that over the years working within the TUC, we've been very frustrated at the lack of action of the national leadership of the, of the trade union movement around unemployment. Just to give you an example, in 81, there was a... Uh, Congress in 81, a decision taken by of two major unions to look at the possibility of opening their doors to recruiting the millions of unemployed people directly into the unions. They took a decision economically that it couldn't be done. And we criticised them at the time and we say that the doors should be open to unemployed people and we should organise the unemployed because if you don't organise the unemployed, they can use unemployed people to undermine wages and conditions and actually scab on workers in struggle. It seems like the unions have been, have been built around work and the, the rules which they developed were, were developed around the idea of, of permanent work. I, mean, I think they need to be more flexible. They need to actually look out to communities and say, well, what can we do in this area and how can we build some sort of yes. community politics involving those yes. people who, who have got traditional trade union backgrounds. If unions want to reach the people who are discontinuously employed, who are employed at intervals only, who have to move from one job to another. 
They can't organize, they do temporary work mainly. They can't organize them at the workplace. They can only reach them by building uh, centers, community centers in, in, the, in the neighborhoods where unions are functioning permanently as uh, places of gathering, of counseling, of cultural activities, of cooperative activities, of workshops, of uh, exchange of knowledge. The neighbors came together in solidarity for the swan hunters. It's only a star that we should build it. From rock bottom up, we've got to keep on going. The right to work is a fundamental human right, but work itself is now being redefined, not by us, but for us. We must start building paradise now, before being bulldozed into oblivion. Couldn't sell you some snake oil, could I? <laughs>